Awesome. I am so excited you are here this week with us today. Uh, you know, you've already seen the guest name and maybe that name wasn't familiar to you. You know, week after week, we have some of the top coaches around, really around the world, come onto the show. One of our goals with the Gill Connections podcast is to also introduce you to people kind of, um, I don't know, what's the cliche, behind the scenes that are working for our sport that, you know, aren't the coaches. So they don't, they're not necessarily always in the press releases and, uh, you know, the athletes aren't mentioned their names. And today I've got a great, great, uh, person for this. I've known him for years now and super excited to have him on the show. Help me welcome Mr. Irvin Lewis. Irvin, how are you, sir? Doing well, Mike. Thank you for having me. Oh man. You know, I, I, how, how long ago did we meet? I was, I was trying to think that was it, <laughs> uh, Mike, it's, it's been a while now. It has. I, I would say, uh, I mean, we're, we're going on eight, maybe Seven, that, that's seven, eight thinking. years Seven, now? eight, yeah. We're, we're pushing yeah. the, the decade button here, getting close, which just means that we're getting old is really all <laughs> that, that means. But uh, when I first met Irvin, uh, it was when we were working with the University of North Florida for some equipment and things like that. Uh, but even at that point, you know, if you know anything about track and field, you know about University of North Florida's facility, right? It's in Jacksonville, Florida, which is gorgeous on its own. The campus is gorgeous. And then about, I don't know, probably it was 13, 14 years ago now, uh, they rebuilt their entire kind of track facility area uh, and just did it re really world-class, first class all the way. And since then, gosh, you guys have hosted uh, NCAA regionals, first rounds, uh, Florida high school state meet. Uh, what, what else have you hosted there? I know, has there been some USATF summer? Yes, we've hosted USATF junior Olympics. We, um, hosted USATF masters. We've hosted, um, now uh, our first, um, American track league, um, right. event on, on national TV. Um, we have, um, a professional, um, organization, that, that trains with us here as well. Um, so we've we've hosted tons of meets and um, it's been really beneficial, um, not only for the athletic department, but for the city of Jacksonville and the University of North Florida. And, you know, with this wacky year we just had, which turned out amazing, by the way, I know, you know, fast go back to January and we were all kind of like, what is going to happen this year? No one had any clues, uh, even if we were going to have a year still back in January. Uh, the Big Ten had a very unique situation that they put themselves in where they only competed in their conference. And because of they're in the north, they wanted to, for good weather, come down south. So, you know, it's an all Big Ten meet. They could probably have their pick of any facility they wanted. And North Florida was chosen for that. They, you guys, ho I thought this was the uniquest thing in the world. You guys hosted a Big Ten invite at your facility as well. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. That was that was amazing because that gave us the opportunity to kind of lay out our blueprint for how we want to host track meets this year. Um, being the COVID year, um, you know, so many things were changing. Not only changing weekly, but it seemed like they were changing daily. And to have um, the University of Iowa and their staff to reach out to us um, with that possibility of hosting um, a Big Ten event here, um, we were truly excited. Um, one, just to have track and field again going on, but two, for them to entrust in us and um, to host their their event um, here at University of North Florida. You know, we're part of the Atlantic Sun Conference, and. You know, I, I guess our reputation really spoke for itself um, with them contacting us and inquiring about having to meet here. Yes, the, the weather was was great, um, even though I think they brought some cold weather down here with them um, during that time because it was hot as Hades um, prior to them coming and all of a sudden it got a cool a cool spell that came through. But it absolutely, um, it was an amazing event because it gave us an opportunity after a year and a half to get back outside to host an event, but to really um, kind of work out the kinks in regards to COVID and all the um, all the difficulties it presents um, from hosting meets, running events, and you know, period. So um, it was really beneficial not only for probably the Big Ten um, institutions that came down, but it was really beneficial to us because it actually gave our administration across camp, uh, campus, gave them a sense of confidence that um, we are in tune to what we need to do to host events here um, with the NCA, that the NCA East prelim that was looming 
Um, and it gave, gave everyone a sense of, of, of confidence that, okay, we're back, um, we're working out the, the details and we have the necessities in place in order to be successful. Uh, we had Norbert Elliott, the head coach of Purdue University on the show, literally like we recorded the Monday, Tuesday after the North Florida meet and he was talking about the cold weather. And I was like, well, I was like, besides that, because let's be fair, they don't have control over the weather. How was it? And, you know, spoke very, very highly, uh, not only of the facility, but how the meet was run as well. So uh, kudos to to North Florida and the Ospreys, by the way, if you don't know what an Osprey is, you got to go look it up. I love unique mascots. So uh, a shout out to North Florida with the Ospreys and, and real quick shout out to North Florida's coaching staff, Jeff Pig and, and guys and gals really first class doing it right down there. I was down for a visit and was in Jeff's office and his athletes were coming in to, you know, get the snacks and talk about the practices. Some of the most respectful athletes I have ever seen. Every one of them, when they saw me in the office, were like, oh, I'm sorry, my bother. And, you know, we were like, no, no, come on in. They're, oh, how are you? Oh, what do you do? Oh, I mean, they were just like really, I hate to say young adults because that's what they are, but like really mature. Every, I mean, like to a T, every one of those athletes were very, very respectful. And I just thought that uh, is a direct reflection of the leadership from the coaches and the administration that, you know, they deal with on a, on a daily basis. Well, well Mike, it's, it's funny that you, it's funny that you say that. And, you know, I've, I've worked a ton of places uh, all along the Southeast and um, here at the University of North Florida, they're very, it's very unique. It's very unique. Um, and our, our student athletes are, are truly amazing. Our coaches have done a great job of recruiting um, great young men and women to come and represent our university, but represent themselves and represent their families as, as well. And that's what it's really all about. It's really all about. And I, I tell everyone um, what we do and how we do it is, is really just a, a sense of coming undeniable. When you walk on our campus, when you meet our staff, when you meet our coaches, when you meet our student athletes, um, you want to give a sense that it's undeniable that you made the right decision to be here. It's undeniable that you made the right decision to host a meet here and things of that nature. And, you know, every, every day you just have an opportunity to get better. And if you can communicate at a high level and, and you can really re respect not only the job, but respect the people in the job, then I think you, you have a chance to do something um, really amazing, not only um, here at the institution, but around the city and, and um, especially in the daily lives of our student athletes. Absolutely. So, you know, we're going to learn a little bit about you, Irvin. There's three, you, know, you have many, many roles from father <laughs> to son and uh, many, many, we're going to talk about a couple of work roles as they relate to track and field. So um, the first one that I'd like to talk about is your title there. One of your, one of your titles there. <laughs> and, uh, that's how you know you're, you're, you're important. Not only do you have a big fancy title, Irvin, you, you've got more than one big fancy title. So the first one I'd like to talk about is a little bit, uh, we kind of got into it there uh, with some of the meets is you are the uh, associate AD of facilities and operations. So when I hear that, first of all, I met you when you were just like facilities manager, you've been uh, promoted up, which shout out to UNF for getting it right, not letting this guy go and making sure he's taken care of. Very good job there, uh, Ospreys. Uh, but when I hear facilities and operations as it relates to track and field, I know about the track, the practice track, the throw in area, things like that. And then operations would be the, the track meets and um, maybe meet uh, uh, practices and stuff like that. So maybe let's take a step back. Tell us what, what is your role? What does the Associate AD of Facilities and Operations do at North Florida? First of all, Mike, I, I think I may have gotten a bump since since you last known this is the senior Associate AD for internal operations and oh. facilities operations is included in that. Um, but now I will be the first to say, and I say to my coaches all the time, Mike, um, the titles really don't matter. Um, I'm a team player and, you know, I'm, I just really like just helping them. I, I like for my coaches and, and the departments in which um, I'm over, I just like to be in the background and lend support when they need me. So my role, Mike, is really to oversee all the internal operations for game day management, for external events coming on the campus, also our um, oversee the sports medicine, um, strength and conditioning um, units here on campus, as well as all the athletic 
athletic grounds and facilities operations, you know, keeping the fields up and, and things of that nature. Um, I'm also the liaison um, with, you know, facilities, with facilities planning, um, with our um, Universal Police Department, Park and Services, um, you name it. And I'm also a, a adjunct professor here in our College of Education. Um, I'm teaching a facility management course. So um, that's that's what my daily um, job entail. It just happened that um, I've become really familiar um, with the help of a lot of great people and a lot of great coaches came really familiar with um, hosting great events. And, you know, I know we get a lot of notoriety for how we host track and field events. And that's one reason why I'm on this podcast but we've hosted a lot of events here on campus um, in the realm of um, collegiate athletics. And the one thing that is taken from all of the events that we host is, is our people, hmm. is our people, is our staff. And if we can continue to empower and encourage our staff on, on the importance of, of communication and, and doing things the right way and not taking shortcuts, then, you know, I would like to say, I, I like to put our staff and our university up against anyone in the, in the country on how to do things the right way. Overseeing all the facilities, especially on a campus as wide and varied as UNF. So you've got, I mean, obviously, you know, track and field, that's our number one sport here because we're track and field, right? So you have the track and field facilities, but you also have baseball, softball facilities, beach volleyball facilities, obviously basketball facilities. Um, I'm probably missing 20 different other facilities. I mean, you, you can't do it all. So you have to have a team. How do you empower that team? What are some of the leadership principles that you put into place with your team so that they can just quote unquote, go get the job done? Well, absolutely. One thing I always believe in is, is, is being a servant leader, being a servant leader. And, and what I like to do, Mike, to be honest with you, I like to listen more than I actually talk. Um, I've become a very good li listener. And I think when you're working with a team or a staff, whether they've been here a while or they're totally new, um, the one thing that I kind of pride myself in doing is, is meeting them where they are. I like to meet them where they are. And I like to set goals and expectations. And, and one thing I like to tell people is, you know, I would like to hire people and work with people that will one day take my job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and to empower them to think like me, to think I was outside the box, to be proactive and be willing to just work. Um, that's one of my hashtags that I, I tweet and all the time is, is, is just work, mm -hmm. you know? And what I, what I really try to do is really try to communicate with them and, 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 and solve the, the problems that may occur and look at adversity as, as an opportunity to get better. Because if, if you're in the world of athletics and, Every day you turn on your computer, you know, you can have a game plan of what the day may look like, but every day you turn on your computer, um, you're going to see something that's going to kind of throw you off track, you know, kind of face it first and stuff. And it's really how we deal with that. And, and you know, if you become a better listener and, and really just communicate at, at a high level, you'll solve a lot of the issues that may arise. Um, I try not to let them see me sweat much. I really try not to let, even in the heat of hosting a, a East Prelim NCAA championship track meet or a high school state championship, things of that nature, when you got coaches calling, coaches texting, parents screaming, I try not to let them see me sweat. Um, and I think that has served, has served me well. I think that's just a, a really a testament of, of, of my mom and dad and how they raised me um, to really just, just work um, keep out the noise, keep out the noise and stay focused on the, on the task at hand. And uh, I'm, I'm blessed to work with a lot of great people, a lot of great people. And, um, and I don't, I don't babysit. I don't hold hands and things of that nature. I help when my help is, is wanted or, or needed or whatever. Like yesterday, I came in and mowed a couple of fields myself. You know, um, I like to get my hands dirty. I don't always sit behind this desk. Um, but I think it's important if you have staff members, whether they're inside or they work outside, just to see you in a different light, to see you in a different role, 
And I think they gain a greater appreciation for who you are and what you bring to the table. So the team and the staff that we have in, have in place, I think they know that um, one, that I will work and two, that I will listen and help them in any way possible. And I think um, knowing that it only trickles down to the student athletes in which we serve. Now, the vast majority of our listeners are coaches, track coaches. So coaches, I want you to pay attention. So we have a senior leadership, uh, administration leadership position here in Mr. Lewis, right? And go back and listen to the three things he said there about leadership. First of all, he started over overall with servant leadership. And I love that. I think I love that so much because that's very um, similar to, to our philosophy here at, at Gill Athletics. You know, our, our president CEO works for our VPs and our VPs work for our managers and our managers, we work for our entry levels, et cetera. It's, it's that, uh, you know, you normally have that pyramid, right? Where the, the president or the CEO, whatever sits on top, we, we actually turn that upside down and they work upwards. You know, we're working for the people that are uh, underneath us, uh, so to speak, as far as the, the hierarchy. So I love that. And with that, you talked about three things I thought was extremely important that as you were talking about it as a uh, administrator and manager in the facility and operations world, I thought it was like 100% applicable for coaches and track coaches. You said, listen, like, wow, like the most successful coaches that I know they're always listening to their athletes. What's the feedback on their body and their mental state and how the training's going and what's going on outside of track and how that affects the, the body with stress, et cetera. So listening, meet them where they are. That is, I don't think we talk enough about that type of, of thought process of, you know, everybody is in a different state, no matter where you are. So each one of your people come in every day they're different every day, right? Something else has happened, good and bad, uh, to them. What, where are they today, and how can I help them grow today? So meet them where they are. Your athletes are going to come to you in a thousand different states. <laughs> they're going to be happy. They're going to be sad. They're going to be bored. They're going to be overstimulated, uh, etc. How can you help them in that state? Meeting them where they are, and then the third one, as a head coach and as a manager, is coaching people, teaching people, training people to take your job. Now that's a tough one, right? Because we have ego that gets involved and ego's not, you know, we've talked about ego several times on the show. Ego is not a bad thing. It, it can be a bad thing, right? but it's also a good thing. If you don't have ego, you sometimes don't have pride in your job and where you move on to, et cetera. But you know, helping someone to take your job, you know, teaching them to become better and, and whether it's at your place or another place, that is sometimes hard because there's this insecurity of like, oh man, if I pour into this uh, you know, manager, they could take my job and I'll be out of a job. And it's like, no, that's not actually <laughs> how it works, but that's a hard one. But I think about a, a head coaches helping their assistant coaches become maybe future head coaches, you know, sharing some of the workload. Uh, some assistant coaches are just on the track and I'm not saying that in a bad way, but they never learn how to become a, you know, a scheduler of a, of a track season of meets. They don't learn budgetary. They don't learn right. scholarship budgeting, et cetera. And then they get their first head coaching gig and they are lost. <laughs> I mean, they're right. learning everything on the fly. So uh, I just thought those, you know, you're, you're talking in a very managerial facility operational side, but I thought how applicable that was for head track or for track coaches in general. Yeah. I I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and Mike, if you really, you know, dig down into the, the details is, you know, when you start recruiting, you start recruiting student athletes and their families and, you know, and you make these promises, you know, these promises that one, that you're going to be a father figure, a mother figure, you know, while they are away from home and represent your university. If they need you, you're there. Um, all of those things that are, are intertwined in, within the recruiting process and as a leader um, in, in all your respective areas, whether it's a coach, uh, administrator, or whatever, you're a direct reflection. You're a direct reflection as administrator. I'm a direct reflection of my coaches. I'm a direct reflection reflection of, you know, my athletic trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, the guys who maintain the facilities. I'm a direct reflection of our internal security um, officers that we have in, in place. So how I conduct myself on a daily basis, how I go about my business on a daily basis 
is a direct reflection and it should trickle down. And so if I'm at my best, if I'm, I'm, at, I'm the best version of myself every day and how I do things and why I do things and my, my why is consistent every day, then that should have a, a positive impact on the entire department for everyone I touch, uh, coaches down to my student athletes. And then when those student athletes communicate with their families back home, with their coaches back home and potential recruits um, about their experience at the University of North Florida and things of that nature, that should be a positive influence. And so that's what's important to me every day. It's not about you know the constant changes. It's not about the adversity. It's not about the, the different rules. It's not about the NCAA and, and the different initiatives is coming out. It's about, can you be the best version of yourself every single day and the impact that that's gonna have on everyone that you work with and every department that you touch. I love that you mentioned your why. If you haven't seen the uh, TED talk from Simon Sinek, where he talks about your why. So, you know, there's the what you do and then the inner kind of the inner circle is the how you do it. And then the core is why you do it. Uh, do yourself a favor, go Google right now, Simon Sinek, why Ted talk. I think it's, I only think it's like maybe 15 minutes. It's not long at all, but you will uh, highly benefit from it. Trust me uh, on that. So uh, Irvin, you've done operations and facilities here at UNF for several years now. What can you tell us about this year? When you, you mentioned a whole, but I mean, there's things that, you know, as track coaches and, you know, as me as a track equipment guy, never think of you mentioned security uh i mean i know i guess i don't really think about mowing the grass but i know that has to get done right i, I guess i just expect it to be when i show up at a meet it's like oh the grass only grows that high right you don't have to cut it it just it's magically just stops at that high but what, what were some of the things that were different this year i mean you hosted one of the largest meets in the country this year as far as you know number of athletes the, the east regionals uh what were some of the things that had to be done differently how was the um you know we talk about things changed on a daily sometimes hourly basis how was the compare comparing to your last regionals hosting how was it this year as far as just operations so the facility I, I almost said the facility stayed the same that's not true because you got a unbelievable uh, upgrade on your track surfacing man it looks amazing um so it's not the same facility, but, you know, the layout and everything was the same. But how, how operationally was it different under these um, crazy times that we had this year? I would say, Mike, I think first and foremost, the one thing is is, is having um, a consistent staff. I think that stayed mm -hmm. the same. I think the, the, the biggest challenge for, of a, for us all is just remaining flexible. Mm -hmm. I think that, that, that was the biggest challenge because even while hosting the event, things change. Um, and so you may think I'm crazy, but I, before we um, really started talking to um, Jeff Maliski and the NCAA staff, I spent a couple of days up in the press box over at the stadium looking out um, because I know the blueprint was going to be different. Um, I know Tent City was going to be totally different with COVID and the challenges involved, I know spacing was going to be different. Right. And so it's the one thing that I know coaches like, coaches like consistency, you know, coaches like the direction and we need to be as organized and as consistent as possible from the very first moment, the very first bus or van pulled on campus with athletes and try to remain consistent because when, when you're hosting a high level event, a championship or whatever, coaches need to coach. You know, they need to be focused on their student athletes. Um, now, I can't control the, the changes um, from the testing protocol to right. the NCAA changes and things of that nature. But as the host, I need to ensure that what we do and how we do is as consistent as possible. So I think just remaining flexible during that time. And, you know, we, we really talked as a staff. We talked as a staff before that event came on campus and just kind of encouraged them and empowered them. Hey, just remain calm, changes, adversity is gonna come. You know, just let me know, we'll make the, the necessary changes and we'll move forward. And so I think we, we, we've done that, but in hosting every single event as the changes occurred with COVID, as the changes occurred with vaccinations and things of that nature, 
because you, you know how it went. And, you know, what, most people got vaccinated. You know, they wanted to toss the mask to the side where we're still under mandate from a university standpoint. And some people are not as comfortable to be around others without masks. And, and so all of those things came into play. And so the most important thing I thought about is how can we conduct a championship that will serve the masses, that parents can be a, a, a part of, they haven't seen their kid compete in over a year, they can enjoy the experience, but yet we'd be safe because we knew the national championship going out to Eugene was gonna come two weeks later. So having those protective zones, things that, that was the huge, that was the large challenge. And I felt, I felt so, you know, bad for the coaches because I know the coaches want to see the running events and things of that nature, but we were mandated to keep them separate from the spectators. And as the host, we we um we did what were, was required of us. Um, but the biggest thing is just being out there able to compete, but remaining flexible as challenges came um, our way, and just keeping the student athletes um, safe. And um, I really think that they enjoyed their time here in North Florida. And as a result, they got out to Eugene and, and competed well. And, and um, that's all we can really ask for. Mark. I love that, you know, the things that are in your control and the things that are outside of your control, state mandates, university mandates, etc. All the while, your main focus was, well, how can we put on the best uh, available track meet for the athletes and so the coaches can do what they do, coach. They, you know, have them worry as little as possible about all the other stuff focus on your athletes so that you can go to the big dance up at Oregon. So before we transition to your second, one of the second uh, titles that you have, uh, I do have to, I have a very important question. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a rib you here a little bit. Who forgot to pay the electricity bill for the, <laughs> for the, now I hope that's not a sore subject because it ended up being something pretty special, but without throwing anybody under the bus here, what, what happened with the <laughs> lights and the four by four? Well, we had we had a power surge throughout the entire south side of, of Duval County to be honest. I think it went over to St. John's County as well. Oh, so it wasn't um, isolated to the either the campus or the it was county wide. No, it was it was it was um twelve to fifteen miles out. It went out all the way at the beach. And so um it wasn't an isolated thing. I, I think our bills were paid. <laughs> um but it was a, a an opportune time for the, the, the city city's grid to have a power surge but you know the great thing about that whole um ordeal mike is at the time i was in the top of the press box when it when we had the lights go out and i had to sprint down to the uh, <laughs> the room where all the breakers were and everything and so if you met me if you know me you know i'm not a small guy <laughs> at all and plus I had, you know, I had knee replacement surgery about two years ago. So this was the first time that I actually sprinted with my new knee. And I must say it worked, it worked. <laughs> and I, I got down there in record time to check all the power breakers and stuff. And when I got down there and opened the door, I, I realized that I left my glasses upstairs. And so I couldn't see any of the numbers on the breakers to see if anything has tripped or anything, but I didn't test my need to sprint back upstairs. I, I kept it going down. I was fine going up. I didn't test it, but um, it wasn't the breakers. It was a power surge, but um, that, that's, that's a great question. And you know what, even though that happened and, and um, it's, a, it's a great story because I mean, to go back and look at the video and when the lights went out, everybody cameras went on. And exactly. stuff. And so some people say it's, it was pretty cool. Um, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you because I was in a full sprint <laughs> to get down several flights of, flights of stairs to get down to the control room. That's why I, you know, I could have fun with you a little bit because what ended up happening ended up being pretty special with all of the camera light, you know, the uh, phone camera lights and stuff coming on, uh, people still running fast. It appeared that all the quote unquote right team still made it through and all that kind of stuff, you know, it, it ended up being pretty neat. Uh, and I'm glad that it wasn't, you know, I'm glad we get to dispel the myth right here that it was not a North uh, Hodges stadium or North Florida, University of North Florida, that it was 
countywide. And I'm sure there's some, you know, the other region was in Texas and with all the grid problems, I'm sure there's some kind of joke there about electric, electrical grids in Texas and now Florida that uh, we'll just, you know, as a non-political podcast, we'll just stay away <laughs> from, from all that. Yeah. So talk to us. Another reason we invited Irvin on the show today was because not only is he over the facilities and operations of one of the more active and therefore important track facilities in this country for track and field, but also you sit on the NCAA track and field committee. Uh, and I know, you know, it's the incident of lay and it's a committee. So I'm sure you had to swear an oath of secrecy and things like that. I know Jeff Malinsky well enough. There's some initiation <laughs> that you had to go through. Uh, what can you tell us uh, as far as like people who just don't know, what, what does the committee do? What, what, what are you guys in charge of? What are some of the activities that you have to do during championships, et cetera? What, what, what kind of un- pull back the, the curtain for us, so, uh, so to speak, to tell us what does the incident of track and field division one track and field committee do? Well, I think, Mike, we, we kind of oversee, we're like the governing body, kind of overseeing, um, first and foremost, the championships, whether it's cross country, indoor, outdoor. But we also, you know, um, want to make sure that what's printed in our rule books is consistent to what we're doing um, as officials, as committee members, and things of that nature. And really just trying to um, give um, coaches a platform to um, really um, kind of move track and field um, forward and um, whatever we can do to enhance that um, as a committee with working with the coaching body and, and working with um, Sam Seams and, and, and the great staff that he has put together. Um, we're, we're not a one-stop shop at all. You know, we, we, got a, we got a job to do as the governing body, as a government committee and things of that nature. But I think our our number one job and priority is to make sure that we're consistent to what's printed and to what our actions are. But also to have the foresight and, and looking ahead and be proactive in our thinking and to really engage on what's coming next in, in, in the world of track and field and things of that nature and to really um, set the table or our future student athletes to come as as changes evolve in, in our sport, and I think that's what you you really have to do because um, now um, you know we're see, seeing bigger, better, faster athletes. Um, we have great coaches all around the country that are really sharpening their skills, becoming more educated. Um, technology has really, really ramped up in helping um, coaches become better coaches and things of that nature. Well, how will that impact what we do and, our, and the decisions that we make, the rules that we pass, the rules that we put in place? Um, is that going to be consistent with the rules of USA track and field? Is that going to be consistent with helping our student athletes here in the United States as opposed to um, when they start competing internationally or um, getting ready for the Olympics and things of that nature. So um, we, we're a, we're a part of the process, and if we can do anything to further, um, you know, help the sport of track and field, which is is such an awesome art and event, um, that's that's what we do. And so um, it's been a learning process um, for me, to be honest with you, and I and I'm so appreciative to. Um, former coach here, um, Mark Van Alstyne, who really got me in, involved and, and got me to envision what Hodges Stadium could become and, and things of that nature. And it just evolved to me um, doing a, a pretty decent job and, and then being selected on, on this committee. But that's what I would say our, our job is. Is it a volunteer position or a nominated position how does it like how did you get on? it's a nominated position it's a nominated and i got nominated i got nominated by coaches i also got nominated by our, um our conference and mm-hmm. um, our conference um commissioner mr ted gumbert who's, who's done an amazing job for the a sun and um since we were hosting the a sun championship outdoors here um since i since i came here um years ago um I think he's been a, a real advocate for track and field. Um, he has really helped me out a great deal. Um, and 
and the ASUN conference and just putting my name out there to be a part of such a prestigious committee has, has really, really um, served me well. And I think it served the conference well mm-hmm. as, as well as um, serving the other committee members well. How many years have you been on it now? Uh, do I get a COVID year back? Of course, oh. we all get a free. <laughs> we all get a free COVID. That year just didn't even happen. Like we don't celebrate birthdays. Like we're all a year younger. Everything, absolutely. I, I think it's it's been two. I think I have. I think I have two two more years. Two more years on the committee. So with two years of experience, and the, you know, I think. COVID gave us like four years of experience compacted into one. It's kind of a, a juxtaposition. We don't count it, but it also gave us so much stress and, <laughs> and adjustments. Oh, absolutely. It, it counted as several years. What did you, when you were nominated and you thought, yeah, you know, I don't have enough to do. I should also <laughs> give my time to this committee. Uh, what did you think the committee type work and time commitment would be? And now compared to what the actual, you know, what reality is, what are some of the things that you've learned as far as like, oh, I didn't know that we had to do x and we actually do a big part of that or, or whatnot well it, it was fortunate um mike to be honest with you that i've served on on different leadership um committees um, within the nca over the years prior to being nominated to the nca division one track and field committee so i was kind of familiar with the type of work committees um perform Um, But I will say that, you know, I'm a football guy, you know, um, the world of track and field is totally new for me, Um, but I was willing to learn. I I looked at it as an opportunity to get better and to educate myself more on the process. And I knew that by serving on this committee, I will get to, um, one, sit at the table and see how most of the decisions are made to see, you know, how the, the championships are conducted, the expectations of the NCA in running a championship and things of that nature. So all those things really ran through my mind. I was like, oh man, I'm, I, I want to get better. I want to see how they do things. And, you know, even to last weekend now out in Eugene, you know, I was, uh, I'm part of the committee, but I was taking in everything, how they ran their operation mm. um, because I want to become better. I want to become better, and I, I, I know Jeff and would, would say the first, the first year, year and a half, you know, um, while sitting on this committee, you know, I, I, I think I was fairly quiet, you know, because I was learning and, and kind of listening as I always do to the reason behind um, how certain committee members see or view certain situations and, and things of that nature. But now I think I'm growing into my own. And um, I'm quick to verbalize um, things that I'm experienced and, and have somewhat um, knowledge about. But it's an ever evolving process and a learning process that is invaluable. It's, it's, it's truly invaluable. And um, um, so I was I was excited, a little nervous, but I was excited. Um, now, you know, I, I look and say I got two more years left. I wish I had another five, ten years left because I think. I think it, track and field is going to get bigger and better. Is it just four-year segments, and or do you can you do like a two four-year segments, or is it just four and done? No, I, I wish we can. Um, yeah. Matter of fact, I'll bring that up um, next um, committee call we have and say, hey, can, can we re up? Can we re up another four years? But I think it's I think it's I think I got four years because I rolled into a half a year for someone, mm-hmm. and then they gave they redid the entire voting right. process and so um that's why i think i'm adding in that extra year yeah but i think it's only a three-year stint i'm sure when you get on that conference call and you say hey mike cunningham thinks i'm sure that will help uh the cause <laughs> that's when everybody puts their mute button on like all right i don't if mike cunningham says that, i don't want to hear it i don't want to hear it. I, I do want to give a shout out to you know not only the division one committee but division two and division three i personally have worked with the division one and division two committees uh however all my teammates have worked with the division three committees throughout the last five years now as the uh, NCAA equipment sponsors. If you don't know, if, if you if you think that the committees that your track and field committee only just kind of sits up in their chairs and lords down on the rules and decisions, you got it wrong. Irvin talked about getting his hands dirty. This is what impresses me about the committees. When it's championship time, 
they are all in. I'm talking about when we do packet pickups, that's when we do the gifts and then you, you know, your relays and all that kind of stuff, your, your credentials. You know who's running that? That's your committee. <laughs> that's your committee working for you, the rest of the coaches. And that committee is made up of some coaches as well who are given their time during the championship. So uh, shout out to all three of the Division and NCAA track and field committees. If you don't know who your committee members are, you should find out. Go Google. That's how I found out all their email addresses and just tell them thank you because it is a volunteer position that they're doing on top of their all their other stuff. So uh, so shout out to you, Urban Man. I appreciate, you know, again, you must not have had enough to do work-wise. So you're just like, well, let me go spend more hours of a week. But uh, but it really boils down to your, you know, this theme that we're going through here now with you is this servant leadership. How do I serve others? How do I give value to others? I'm curious, you mentioned about, you know, learning and always getting better. And that's kind of the mantra of a servant leader. I've, I've noticed uh, interviewing, you know, now hundreds of, of coaches and people in this great sport. What are you, you know, everybody kind of learns or advances differently. Some people are readers, some people are podcasters, some people are uh, uh, TEDx talks, uh, etc. How are you? Are you a, what do you, how do you consume uh, improvement? Is it, are you a reader? Are you a listener to other people? T talk to me a little bit about your process of continuous improvement. Well, to be honest with you, Mike, I'm a combination of all those things. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I really, um, I'm really a, a, a spiritual person. Um, my faith is, is so important to me. And actually, Mike, I'm a writer. Um, I write, I write, if not every day, <laughs> I write several times a week. Really? And yeah, that's, that's, that's what, that's, that's what I do behind, behind the scenes. I, I, I write and um, like, that right, gives right. me comfort. Like journaling? Like, are you, is it like at the end of the day, you're downloading observations throughout the day? Or is it like maybe in the beginning of the day? And so you're talking about what you hope to accomplish? If you don't mind, what, what's this writing process for you? To be honest with you, Mike, is I, I do both. Hmm. I, I, I do both um, when I have time. Um, most of the time, um, I, I write at night. And, 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 and when I, I look back over what I wrote the night before, I look back over that next morning. And um, I do a lot of motivational writing. Um, I'm big on, on mentorship. Mm -hmm. And actually, I have my um, I have my own consulting business, Winners versus Champions. Of course, because you're not I, you're not busy enough. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're just trying to fill the day. I get it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's really it's it's my way of giving back um, because so much has been given to me, so much has been given to me, and so many people have invested in, in, into what you're seeing right now, that um, that I really take pride in ownership and, and giving back, and you know, and my winners versus champions, um, you know, that that motto is, you know, I want to win every day in order to champion my life forever. And that's what I try to really give back. And so um, I would say I'm a combination. I'm a combination of it all. But I think um, one of my greatest attributes is I, I'm, I love to sit back in the scenes and, and listen. I, I just I just love to listen because you can learn so much, um, not only what to do, but what not to do mm. and, and listen. And then I just govern myself accordingly. I govern myself accordingly in, in the way and I do things, how I do things, and most importantly, for whom I do things with. Um, my circle is very small. Um, that's that's totally intentional. I keep business and personal totally separate. Um, and I've been doing that for, for 20, 20 plus years and it has served me well. Uh, the terrible segue since you just said you keep personal and business separate. Well, I was gonna ask, you know, you talked about writing in the morning and writing at night and, you know, we're friends on Facebook. Uh, I don't know when you sleep, by the way, because your son, t tell me a little bit if, if it's okay. Your son oh, yeah. is like this athletic, like, he, he, tell, tell us a little bit about his sports and what he's going to be doing and is doing like this kid's, this kid literally is a gym rat. I swear every post from 1am, 6am, 10 at night, it don't matter. This kid's working on his craft. Tell me a little bit uh, about him. Yeah. Um, my, my son, Austin, um, first, my, my wife's name is Tanya. And um, we have two boys, um, Austin and Trenton. Austin is 18. Um, he just graduated. He's a, he's a senior. Um, he plays basketball. Um, Trenton is 13. Uh, Trenton's going to the 
to the eighth grade awesome. um, this year and super excited about both of, of, of my young men um, and the people that they are. I mean, just truly humble, respectful um, boys that I probably only get on them about making sure their room is clean, but they're <laughs> oh, wait. boys. I, I thought that was um, just my kids. Oh, good. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but he is, and and you, and you say that, Mike. You know, um, I'm up every morning around five. And this morning, I, I left out the garage at six, and his car was already gone. He was already going to put in work. Um, wow. He graduated this year from Bishop Stouter High School um, here in Jacksonville, and um, he signed a scholarship to go and um, go to college at Savannah State University. Nice. We're we're truly excited for him with this COVID year and all the challenges for recruiting and things of that nature, but he had, he has persevered. Um, I think I, I put out a post the other day where five years ago, I was training him and a, a few friends. I was training him and a friend named um, Jay and Jay is going to Mercer. Hmm. And um, um, this year he just signed to go to Mercer. I was training him and Jay prior to going on the AAU circuit and they look like they were dying out there on the track and doing exercises. And that, that popped up on my Facebook the other day. And I think I posted something that looked like my, my craziness paid off or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, and my thing is, I, I like them to finish what they start, both of them. Um, but I, I always want them to be better people than they are athletes. And I, I think um, what I see every day, I'm, I'm, I'm truly proud. And, um, you know, I, I give a, a shout out to um, to Tanya because um, she has allowed me to to go and, and work and and really um, my passion for what I do and how I do it um, and to provide the, the type of life um, for them and my boys um, to be really proud of. But um, they, they're super kids, and with everything going on in in, in today's society, you know, just to walk in your house at night and and to see both your kids at home and um, living, doing well, academics, they're sharp and things of that nature. And, you know, <laughs> you know, a, a lot of parents can't, you know, a lot of parents can't attest to certain things, but, you know, I, I knew, I knew I was doing something right, um, you know, as the years went along on this AU circuit, because you know, I'm driving, going from city to city, and the kids sitting in the back with their headphones on, blasting and, and stuff. And it was gospel music that they were playing. It was gospel music they were playing. And, and still to this day, he can pull up to the house and I can hear his music, but he's listening to gospel music and things of that nature. And um, I'm probably more proud of that than anything um, because I think I've, um, done a great job as a father in rearing them the right way. Yeah, I was going to say shout out to you and Tanya, because in my experience, at least, you know, I've got two kids younger, I'm 10 and seven. Uh, but of all the, the jobs that I've done from coaching to here at Gill and other responsibilities, there is, I, I don't know that there's anything tougher than being a parent. Uh, there, there is no, there is no perfect parent, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, unfortunately, there's no perfect child either. Uh, but it's a, it's a struggle day in and day out. And so, you know, for you guys to raise two young men, uh, you mentioned, you know, today's world, which obviously has its own issues, it had its own issues 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago as well. Yeah. Uh, but to have two young men that are, you know, uh, you know, I've seen them, yes, sir, no, sir, type people going to college, uh, doing their craft and, you know, I hate to say staying out of trouble, but staying out of trouble and doing the, the right things. Uh, that's a testament to leadership. And it's the leadership of you and Tanya, as well as the network that you surround yourself with them as well. You know, the influences that they see from their friends, their friends, parents, etc. cetera. So uh, great job, dad. I mean, that's uh, of all the titles we're, we've talked about today and are going to talk about, that's your number one. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Hey, hey, that's, that's, that's it for me. And, and to be, to be honest with you, Mike, that's my why. Mm. That's my why. You, you know, I can't come here at, at the University of North Florida and be a leader if I can't lead my own every single day at my house. And if I can do that, if I can do that, then what I do here at the university is a cakewalk. It's a cakewalk. Well, I know you're listening to this on June 28th, so we've already passed it, but to Irvin and to everybody out there listening, happy Father's Day, man. That's a, uh, it's, it's a, 
it ain't easy, man. And I'm not knocking Mother's Day either because mothers, you, you have a double duty. You got to be a mother and you got to deal with us. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I get it. I get it. But you know, right now father's day is coming up here in a few days. So man, shout out to you. Happy father's day to you, brother. Well, thank you. So let's talk about this third title that we discussed earlier, or we were going to discuss today. Um, I don't know much about it. I'm just kind of curious. I, it doesn't necessarily deal with track and field specifically, but recently, I think it was within the last few months, maybe the last six months, uh, right. you were, I, I assume this was a, um, a new position, but you were named, and I probably got this one wrong too, Mr. Senior AD or Senior AD. I got to <laughs> make sure I get this right here, please. But you have been named for North Florida Athletics, University of North Florida Athletics, the Chief Diversity an inclusion officer. T what does that mean? Tell, tell me what, what does that entail? I, obviously, again, you just were bored and you needed more time, you know, something to do with yourself. You're, you know, the, the operations of a division one athletic facility wasn't enough. The facilities uh, hosting all these meets, being a dad, being a husband, uh, working, volunteering for the division one track and field committee. Obviously that wasn't enough for you. You had to find something else to do. Uh, so tell me, what does this diversity and inclusion officer, what does that mean? What, what are the responsibilities and what are you, what are you doing with it? Well, it was totally a new, a new um, position that was, it was created, Mike, and um, it was really created. It, it started popping up all around the country. Um, as a result of what was going on around the country, um, especially after the, the murder of George Floyd. And um, it was something that, you know, I, I kind of walked into, I, I had no idea. I think I was coming back, either coming back off vacation or, or something when it was presented to me um, to head up um, this position for our department here at the University of North Florida. And, Basically, it, it was to give a, a platform um, to our student athletes, our staff, and, and to be a leader um, of, of departments here at the university um, to talk about diversity and inclusion and to possibly bring upon initiatives of diversity and inclusion, but more importantly, um, um, to be a voice, to be a voice. And at the time, we didn't have a committee um, I developed a committee um, of coaches and student athletes within the athletic department um, to speak on initiatives and to speak um, on ideas of how to bring about unity and how to preserve unity within our department. Um, the reason we had several different reasons why um, that was important, but at the heightened sense of everything that was going on. Uh, around the country at the time, you know, it seemed like what we didn't want, we didn't want things siloed, you know, because here it is, we got oh, 300 student athletes from all around the world here at the University of North Florida. We need to be a voice for them. If they need to talk, if they need to express themselves, things of that, that nature, um, we need to provide that. And so I um, had an idea of, of developing team hall meetings, you know, for, because during COVID, everything, <laughs> everything was done so separately. You telling people, you know, stay within their bubbles, you know, teams don't need to co-mingle, you know, you're getting tested every week. Well, on a normal year without COVID, they're in their bubbles anyway. I mean, because so many different teams, their schedule is different. You know, you may see somebody in the cafeteria, in a class, or whatever, and you may know that they're a student athlete, but you really don't know them. Mm -hmm. You really don't know them. So to me, it was the perfect opportunity for student athletes to get to know each other better. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk. Let me learn your why. Let me learn a little more about you. But also, it was a perfect opportunity to get the, um, our alumni, to get our donor base to get our faculty across campus, to get them kind of involved and, and to get to know our student athletes on a different level. And, you know, here it is, I, I firmly believe in my heart that our greatest resource here at the University of North Florida is our student athletes. It, it, that's, that's my, from an athletic department mm -hmm. perspective, they're our greatest resource, our student athletes. They're 
the reason why we have a job. But you know, here, if you really learn more about our programming and things that we've done and things of that nature, the mere fact that we've now gone 19 years with every sport, all 19 sports, their team GPA is over 3.0, for all 19 sports for nine nine consecutive years wow you know that's that's phenomenal that's a testament of our our staff our, our coaches recruiting good kids our student athletes performing well our academic staff performing well and things of that nature that's great i applaud that but we still need to understand that there's more mm. it's more and when they leave the university it's more so that being the chief diversity and inclusion officer is is really a job that I'm really taking serious. And as a matter of fact, I was sitting here late in the office last night, um, writing down some details for kind of reconforming our committee and, and to get going um, for next year, because I think it's important for all of our staff, all our coaches, even um, across our campus, you know, for, potential student athletes or potential students to come to the University of North Florida, I think is really important for them. You know, when that parent open up our website and they see whether it's a lack of diversity on our athletic staff or a lack of diversity throughout our university, um, I think it's important for us to understand, to recognize, and also to be able to answer the question, why is that? Do y'all have a plan? How do you all talk to potential student athletes in regards to if there's something in place to address that? Um, are y'all addressing from you know per the university? Are you addressing per the athletic department? You know, what is your plan? Um, do you understand why you all um, reached this point? Why you all lack diversity in this area? I see you got student athletes from all around the country. Um, how often do you communicate? How often do coaches of other sports communicate with other student athletes? Like all of those questions are important. And if you're gonna really build your athletic department, if you're gonna really say that you're a unit, you're a family per se, then everyone needs to be on the same accord. Everyone needs to recognize where there needs to be work that needs to be done. Um, how do you address it? Is there a game plan? The whole nine, just like you have a strategic plan for the university, you also should have a strategic plan for every part of your department. And this will be one that will be included. Now, I know the position's new and it was, it's evolving through COVID. So, you know, less face to face and uh, things like that, but we're moving out that, you know, it's hard. I don't want to say it's hard enough, but it's hard as a, as a track coach, I can imagine at least you know, on my experience from my former career, you know, we have upwards of, depending on the size of your squad, 30, 40, 50, 100, 150, some universities and high schools uh, that are all very diverse. That, it's actually what makes track and field to me the best sport there is. It's so diverse, right? I mean, tall, right. short, wide, skinny, black, white, right. brown, don't matter. I mean, there, there is an event for everyone. <laughs> That's the greatest asset we have for our sport. So it's extremely hard just within our sport to help create equality of like, Hey, just because you're a distance runner versus a thrower versus a sprinter, we are people first and foremost, not sprinter, thrower, distance runner, et cetera. And now you're talking about an entire athletic department. Like I, I think about a tennis player over here who may be from another country. Uh, of course, any track kid can be from another country, right? Um, you know, baseball players, they're different in their thought process in, within their sport. Soccer player, you, you don't have football, if I remember correctly. Right, right. Right. So you don't have football. You said 300 athletes. I was like, well, if you have football, there's a third <laughs> right there. So, so that's actually amazing. 300 athletes that and football's not in that. So, I mean, this is all volleyball players that everyone has different seasons, different uh, goal set minds, et cetera. It's hard on a track team. How are you? And I know it's still evolving because it's, it's new and we're in this ever evolving world right now with, uh, with the coronavirus, et cetera. What, what kind of plans maybe do you have in place or have you thought about? I know you, you said you were writing down, which I was like, of course you were. Yeah, we know you're a writer now. What, what kind of things or goals or actions are you thinking uh, to help people 
I don't want to say get to know each other because that sounds like a social, <laughs> right? You know, let's let's have a, a soda social, right? But it's it's more than that. It's more uh, it's more when you talk about diversity and inclusion. It's more about understanding that other person. H- how right. are you? I mean, how do you take three hundred all unique individual people? That that and that's just athletes. Where now we add coaches and administrators and athletic trainers, etc. How how do you like what what do you have planned? How how do you do this? Well, well Mike, you actually answered. And instead of looking at them as a student athlete, as a coach, as athletic trainer, per se, it's, it's simple. They're people. And so I, I think to take a very simplistic approach to it and how you conduct your day and how you treat that person as an individual, as a person, not a student athlete, not a coach, as a person. I think that goes beyond saying how important that is. Um, and, and then I think that is the avenue to allowing a person or, or letting the person know that, you know what, I care. I care for you as a person. It ain't got nothing to do with a student athlete. Mm-hmm. I care for you as a person. And I, I think once you do that, then you begin to build a sense of trust, a sense of trust. And that can go a long ways with your staff coaching staff, student athlete, whatever. Um, I think those are the the the, the, the boundaries and and the and the guards that our committee, our diversity inclusion committee, those are the things that we have to truly express um, to get our other student athletes, our other coaches, staff, constituents, to get them to kind of lower that guard. You know, at the end of the day, you're still a person. At the end of the day, I love you. I love you as a person. Mm -hmm. I care for you as a person, things of that nature. Now, if you happen to be a great athlete, if you happen to be a great coach, a great motivator, a great administrator, whatever, that's icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's, let's keep the real thing, the real thing. Let's keep the foundation where it needs to be. And that's, 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 that's love on each other as, as people. Let me get to know you as a person. Let me get to know you as a father, as a mother, things of that nature. And be genuine about it because when I see my coach or whatever and I ask the question, coach, how was your weekend? You know, how how's the family? How's everyone doing? Things of that nature. I'm genuinely asking that. Now, if that don't have anything to do with if we're facing a little adversity or things were not done right, papers were not signed on time or whatever. That was all things that we can get to solve. But at the end of the day, you're still a person. You're a person for whom I, I care about and things of that nature. And I think a lot of times, I think we kind of, as coaches, as administrators, we kind of push the important things aside to make sure we get our job done. You know, and to me, um, what's the true definition of winning? You know? If, 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 you, if you're winning but not loving, is, 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 it, is it truly winning? Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're, if you're really focused on, on winning or a bonus or, or something like that, um, nah, is it truly winning? Is that truly the culture that you want? Is that truly the culture that you like to create? And my, most importantly, is, is, is that what you want to authentically say to the future of your future staff, of your future student athletes, potential student athletes coming in, things of that nature. Let's really be authentic when we, we're talking about the things that we want to create and the things that we want to do. And I think it really falls back to people, how you are able to communicate and care for people. I think that's what it boils down to. I want to highlight what you said there. I love that about, you know, loving the person for the person for who they are, not their roles, right? Like whether they're a great athlete, a great coach, et cetera. I think it swings both sides as well. You know, loving the person, maybe disagreeing or not liking the mistake they made, whether, you know, serious mistakes, you know, stealing, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but that it's still a person first and foremost. Uh, And if we could get to that level, on a basic level, uh, the world would be 
I mean, infinitely better, not like granularly better. <laughs> We're right. talking about deviations better, man. It's uh, see the per and it goes back to what you said earlier about meeting the person where they are today, you know, meeting where they right. are right now, and that they are persons first. Everything, all your other roles are roles, but the person is the person. We gotta we gotta start seeing the people people first and then Absolutely. moving on from there. Absolutely. Man, Irvin, uh, I'm so happy that you're here today. Uh, you know, I, I'm always trying to expand our coaching community uh, in many, many different aspects. You know, we, 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 it's so funny. We we're talking to a non track guy here, right? He was a football guy. He's an administrator. I love how he talked about, you know, coaches, we talk about, we want to coach and we have to do paperwork. What, what did our administrator say? He's like, you know, and sometimes when the paperwork doesn't get signed on time. So uh, yeah, I, th I think that was directly at every coach who's listening right now, by the way, get your paperwork signed. Whatever paperwork we got to do nowadays, get it signed. Um, I'm also I'm the worst at it, Mike. Oh, you're the worst. <laughs> I'm the worst at it. I mean, I got so many irons in the fire, you know, I, I have a great business manager. I have a great business manager. I love her to death because she will keep me on top of things. That's and key. Say, hey, you need to sign this because I'll be going in a, in a, in a million different directions. But that <laughs> all goes back to empowering and, and loving people. Mm -hmm. And it's not a morning that I don't grace this door that mm -hmm. I don't say good morning. How are you? You know, if it's a Monday morning, how was your weekend? You know, all those things are, are, are so, so important. That's so important in what we do. Well, you're so important to what we do, you know, and what I mean by that is, you know, we very much are focused on coaches uh, and what they mean to our sport and as they mean to our business, et cetera. Uh, but as you mentioned that business manager, you know, no, no one person is an island, right? Just like uh, no one campus facility is an island. You have, uh, you know, state restrictions, university restrictions, et cetera. No one coach is an island. It takes a great facilities manager. It takes great operations people out there getting it done. It takes business managers. It takes equipment manufacturers, etc. We are an amalgamation of uh, the team that we surround ourselves with. Uh, and you are one of those for track and field, one of those great members of the team that, uh, you know, we don't talk about a lot, unfortunately, because we're so focused on coaches. So I'm just so thankful for you, your team. I've met several of your guys and gals, man, and they are, uh, I don't know how good they are besides like how great that facility looks whenever I show up, but they are always super nice. <laughs> like I'm always amazed. Right. Like they come up and talk to me. Like I'm like you know who I'm nobody. You know, like you don't need to talk to me, man. I ain't nobody. And they're just so respectful and so nice. And again, to me, that's a reflection of the leadership and the the other leaders that you have there on campus. So uh, just so thankful for what you do for your servant leadership to our great sport, uh, and just hopeful that this brought you listener value. That there are other people out there. And maybe if you haven't thought about it, maybe you go tell your own operations and facility guys and gals a thank you sometimes we forget we, we kind of just uh you know you know it's every day we don't think about how important air is we just breathe it right well we forget sometimes how important our facilities and operations and security and uh, gosh everything that goes into it uh how important they are so maybe this is a good reminder to go just drop a thank you you know just t tell them thanks for for what they do and everything and Irvin, man just so thankful for you and, and what you do uh, i appreciate it and and to be honest with you mike it's you know, I'm sitting here on this podcast and I'm thinking like, you know, it, it's not really me. It, it, it's, it's not really me. It's what I've actually um, empowered, you know, uh, a, a Coach Pig, a, a Coach Krupa, King, Bryson Valentine, you know, Nick Buta, you know, Caitlin Parson, Nick Morrow. I mean, the entire the entire group who has really helped um, elevate um, UNF to the type of university and program that we that we have here. It's, 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 it's all of them. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm doing a podcast, but really, to be honest with you, I'm speaking on, on all of their behalf because I couldn't be here. You couldn't be saying what an awesome right. job that the University of North Florida um, has done if it had not been for their hard work and their inspiration and, and, and giving me. So um, I think every great administrator um, should be able to pass the buck and understand that it's not solely about them, but it's what they have empowered others to do around them. 
Absolutely, man. And from all of us at Gil, make sure you tell those guys, Bryson, Kate, Nick, I, you know, you mentioned Nick. I was like, oh, Nick, that's right. Uh, <laughs> we worked with him. Uh, please tell them, you know, thank you. you know, Jacksonville and, and specifically University of Florida is a great epicenter for track and field in this in this country, not only nationally with the NCAA meets, the ASUN meet, uh, but even the great state of Florida has their state meet there. And what a great facility to have it at. So thank you uh, to all your crew, uh, the ones that have come and gone and the ones that are going to come in, uh, they're going to be under great leadership. And uh, we're just so thankful for everything. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you for listening today. I hope, you know, a little bit of a different guest, right? Not a coach and not even a track guy, but, you know, he, he talked track pretty good for not being a track guy, didn't he? Uh, so I was pretty impressed there, pretty impressed. Uh, I, get, I do, you know, maybe this is the thankful podcast, but I do just highly encourage you to reach out to people in on your campus that do the jobs that you don't think about sometimes. Look outside and see that that, that grass is cut and that grass is watered and uh, equipment is set up where you need it and taken care of. And there's people who, he mentioned the business manager. We, we don't unfortunately think about the number guys and gals too much but you know what they got to get the bills paid and so you know think about uh just even just a simple email of just thank you uh i think would just go a long way because i know you are thankful and sometimes we just we let it slip that we should be saying thank you to them and so uh so uh thank you for you to be here today so if you found value in today's podcast i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that someone else in your network would probably receive value too so i uh, highly encourage you to share this on facebook Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Morse code, whatever you're using nowadays, uh, send it out to someone else. Even, you know, we talk about all these social medias, you know, what works really well, email and text messaging. You know, if you uh, just shoot someone a link to this uh, podcast and tell them, Hey, I thought you might enjoy this. That would mean the world to us would really just appreciate it. Helping to uh, just give value to others out there. So until next week, come back and have a great week and we'll see you then. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Mike.